welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. There's an old saying that if you want to soar with the eagles by day, you can't hoot with the owls by night. That may be true for some folks, but today we have a highly accomplished eagle who has also been well known to do more than his share of night owl hooting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege to present the illustrious Hoot Gibson. Well, Cindy, thank you very much. And I don't know how she knew about all the hooting with the owls. Well, anyway, um, it is a real pleasure for me to get to be here to address all of you. And after all the buildup this has received, this had better be good, Hoot. So thank you so much. And Bob Johnson, I owe the world to him. He helped get me into test pilot school, and I never would have been able to do all these things that I got to do without test pilot school, because we did not pick astronauts unless they were graduates of test pilot school. So I owe an awful lot to you, Bob, and thank you so much for getting me here. Well, I got to do what's on the screen right now. I'm docked in the space shuttle Atlantis to the Russian space station Mir in this picture. And we're over the Black Sea. The Crimean Peninsula is visible in the lower right part of the picture. That's been very much in the news lately, of course. And this was a really exciting mission, but how did I get, how did I get here? Well, the way I got here was, I was really fortunate to grow up in a flying family. And in this picture, this is mom and dad. And ladies, what's kind of interesting here is this is not dad's airplane. This is mom's airplane. My mother and two of her girlfriends from college decided they were gonna learn how to fly, so the three of them bought a J2 Taylor Cub, and that's how she met my dad. So that was my start growing up in a flying family. So of course I have lots of photos like this of my older brother John and I playing on an airport this happened to be Cooperstown, New York, where my dad was managing the airport. So I was born there uh, in Cooperstown, New York. And I know we have a lot of North American people here, and I got to fly a number of North American airplanes. And I didn't get to fly this one, but I worked out at Edwards Air Force Base the summer of 1968, my last summer before my senior year of college, and I got to watch the XB-70 fly a number of times. And what an incredibly impressive airplane that was. Okay, maybe not quite as impressive, but the first North American airplane I got to fly was in pilot training. And this was a shot of my first solo in a jet in the very modest T-2A Buckeye. Had a single J-34 in it, so, you know, it wouldn't go ground level to 30,000 feet in 30 seconds. But that was my first jet airplane. My second jet airplane I got to fly, this was my first carrier landing, and it's in the T2B Buckeye uh, aboard the USS Lexington. And then at test pilot school under Bob Johnson, as my CO, I got to fly the T2 Charlie. So those were cool airplanes. They were really neat airplanes, a couple of fun North American airplanes. Maybe not as fancy and famous as this one, but a friend of mine owned an F-86E model, Sabre jet, and he let me fly it a bunch of times, which was really great. I don't think I could have afforded the fuel that that thing burned. <laughs> but he let me fly it a number of times, and what a great flying airplane the F-86 is. I, I would say was, but it still is. Just, just a, a real pilot's airplane, really a lot of fun to fly. Well, I got to fly this airplane operationally, the F-4 Phantom, and actually this particular airplane I'm gonna have another slide of here in just a second, but this was my first combat mission in this particular airplane. It had been our MiG killer, uh, the airplane that Gary Wigand flew, side number 201, when he shot down a MiG in March of uh, 1972. And I joined that squadron uh, halfway through the cruise, and so my first 
sortie in the squadron was a was a combat mission and so flew that airplane flying from an aircraft carrier was really cool because you went from this position to this position in three seconds and you're going 175 miles an hour when you get to here there's not a corvette on earth that'll touch it so really exciting to fly from from a carrier and this was that airplane side number 201 uh, bureau number 153019, and like I say, my first combat mission was, was in this particular airplane. It's now on a pole down at uh, Key West, NAS Key West, Florida, and my wife tells me that when you take a jet and you put it on a pole like that, it's called a jet sickle, <laughs> is what that's called. Well, right after I came back from that first cruise in 1972, I got to go through the course at Top Gun. And my first dogfight in Top Gun was against the Navy's MIG ace, Randy Cunningham. And I was nervous. I was 25 years old. I was a lieutenant junior grade, first lieutenant uh, equivalent in the Air Force. And I didn't shoot him down, but he didn't shoot me down either. And I considered that quite a victory against the Navy's MIG ace. So I got to go through Top Gun. I know we've all seen the movie Top Gun. Let me tell you, when I was there, there wasn't anybody that looked like Kelly McGillis there. <laughs> okay, but I think that's fair. None of us were as good looking as Tom Cruise either. But Tom Cruise, eat your heart out. I actually got to go through Top Gun, and not only that, but Tom Cruise, eat your heart out again because I got to fly the F-14 Tomcat. I made two cruises in the Phantom, and then I joined the Navy's very first operational squadron, Actually, there were two squadrons aboard the Enterprise, Fighter Squadron 1 and Fighter Squadron 2. And you could maybe just barely make out on the front canopy, it says, Lieutenant Bob Gibson. They wouldn't let me put Hoot on the canopy. They said, no nicknames. And I said, well, what's Bob? <laughs> they said, it doesn't matter. You're not putting Hoot on it, so just, just shut up and go away. So anyway, this was my Tomcat, and what a great airplane the Tomcat was. Everything the Phantom could do, we did about 15, 20% better. Out accelerated the Phantom, out turned it by a mile, out climbed it, much more sophisticated radar and weapon system. And it was good around the ship. And speaking of the ship, when it was time to come back to that great, big, giant aircraft carrier, <laughs> this is what that giant, big aircraft carrier looks like from up in the air. It doesn't look quite as big from up here. And then you got down low like this, and in close, and you know, the first time you ever went out there, you said, I'm gonna stop in that short a distance? Yeah, well, you'd better. And you notice in this picture, there's not a whole lot of room on the left side, there's not a whole lot of room on the right side. If you land long, you miss the four arresting wires that you can see in the picture. If you land short, it's fatal. So you really had to be pretty accurate uh, coming back to the carrier. Now, the Tomcat was really a good airplane aboard the carrier because we could come in at 125 knots with that great big wing, which as you can see in this picture, full span leading edge slats, full span trailing edge flaps, 125 knots was our approach speed. The Phantom was about 148 knots. So just a whole lot better. Now the A5 Vigilante that Commander Johnson flew was about 170 knots if I remember right. So they used to say those guys are crazy. Anyway, he was my skipper at test pilot school, so I never said he was crazy. He was my boss. And then I got to fly this North American Rockwell airplane, and this was my first launch. This was the Space Shuttle Challenger, and I got to be the co-pilot on the 10th launch of a space shuttle, way back in 1984. And what a ride that was. The launch and the trip to orbit reminded me of a catapult shot that lasts eight and a half minutes. Because you'd go from standing still on the launch pad to cut off in orbit in eight and one half minutes, and at cut off, you're going 17,500 miles an hour. So if you calculate that out, that's more than 2,000 miles an hour per minute average getting to space. Once again, no Corvette on Earth can touch it. <laughs> And on my first mission, well, we did lots of exciting things, but we did this really exciting thing. And that was the world's first untethered spacewalks. Now, no doubt you've seen this photo before, and you've wondered who was the gifted photographer <laughs> that took this photo 
well, I'm the one that shot these photos. And the reason was because during the spacewalk, I was the only person on the crew that could work a camera. No, I was the only person on the crew that had absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> so I was parked at the window, and I got this photo of Bruce McCandless just on his way out making the world's first untethered spacewalk. You notice there's no cables, there's no tethers, no ropes tying him to us. He's flying the rocket backpack. And they used it to fly pretty far away, and equally as important to them, back to the space shuttle as well. Um, although, if they had, I get the question all the time, what if they ran out of fuel? What if they had an electrical malfunction? Well, we could fly Challenger over to him because we had rocket thrusters pointing every direction. So we could fly over to him and rescue him if he promises us enough money for it. <laughs> and nothing like that ever happened. It all just went off perfectly and it was a, a flawless first test of what we called the man maneuvering unit. Now, I'm really glad I got to be a pilot astronaut. Oh, and the other question I get all the time too is, who did you ever get to do any spacewalks? And the way I like to answer it is no. As a pilot astronaut, I am far too valuable to risk me outside. <laughs> but we've got lots of mission specialists. So for example, my wife was a mission specialist on the space shuttle. We never flew together, but you know, we could send them all out and if they didn't all come back, no big deal. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> The reason that the pilots didn't get to do any spacewalks was the amount of training time involved. We spent so much time training on launch, re-entry, landing, rendezvous, docking, malfunction procedures, vehicle systems, to even out the training time, the mission specialists get to do all the spacewalks. I looked out the window and saw this, though, and I was jealous. I was really jealous. He's a human satellite. The Earth is going by under his feet 185 miles away at five miles per second. That's how fast you're moving in orbit. So I was jealous when I saw that. Well, we came back and made the very first landing at Cape Canaveral. And again, this was the 10th launch of a shuttle. We had been trying since the seventh launch to get a shuttle back into the Cape. And the weather was always no go. So we got to make the very first landing back at Cape Canaveral. Well, gee, less than two years later, it's my turn to be mission commander on my second launch aboard Columbia. Now, in this picture, there are some really distinguished people in this photo. Not me, but in the background on the left side, United States Congressman Bill Nelson, who finished up his career as United States Senator Bill Nelson. He was on my crew. This was a little bit of a challenge to have a politician, no offense, Mike, but to have a politician on your crew, uh, although I'll tell you what, he was a real blessing to us. He has just been such a staunch supporter of NASA over the years. And it was really an experience for him because he had never been on a team before. Nowhere in his career had he ever really been part of a team. You can't say the Congress is a team. <laughs> so anyway, can we cut that part out of the video? Anyway. Bill really enjoyed the experience with us, and we have had a number of crew reunions over the years because we all so dearly enjoyed our time together. In the front left of the picture is Major General Charlie Bolden. He flew as my co-pilot on that mission, and then he went on to fly four missions aboard the shuttle and finished up his career as the administrator of NASA and a major general in the Marine Corps. So we had some really distinguished people on that crew, not me, mind you. But we lifted off January the 12th, 1986. Uh, we went to space, and this is where you are at the end of two minutes. And it looks like in this picture that we're going down. We are not. We're following the curvature of the Earth. We're high enough and fast enough at two minutes that we can start accelerating across the Earth. And where are we at two minutes? We're 30 miles up. 30 miles out over the Atlantic Ocean and going 3,000 miles an hour in two minutes. No Corvette on Earth will touch it. So really an exciting ride. My wife was watching and she said the colors of the rainbow were in our smoke trail. The camera just couldn't really catch them, but she said it was just beautiful. And of course, this is what's happening at booster separation. We have burned out the fuel in the booster rockets. Explosive bolts cut them loose from us 
And then rocket thrusters, as you can see, push them away from us because they weigh 88,000 pounds empty. You don't want to recontact it. So they get pushed away from us and then come down in the ocean under parachutes. We tried to land at Cape Canaveral three days in a row and the weather was no go all three days. And finally on the third day, mission control said, guys, we give up, take it one more orbit and land it at Edwards Air Force Base. So my first landing as a mission commander was an unplanned night landing. And this was only the second time that we had landed a space shuttle at night. And fortunately, it came off very well because I could see this being a possibility. So Charlie Bolden and I had done most of our landing training at night, because if you can land it at night, you can certainly land it in the daytime. So really, it wasn't a big problem. 10 days after this photo was taken, we lost the Space Shuttle Challenger and her crew. So we were the only mission of 1986 that survived. And it took us nearly three years to redesign, retest, recertify, and rebuild the booster rockets, which of course had been the cause of the accident. I was the lead astronaut on the investigation team and then also on the, on the redesign team. So the chief astronaut said, okay, you think they're ready to fly again? You go fly them. So I got to command the second launch after the Challenger accident. This took nearly three years. This wasn't until December of 88. And I went to space aboard Atlantis, and we had a top secret classified payload on board. And if I tell you what it was, none of us can ever leave this room. So, so I'm not going to do that. But I will say that we got to fly over some really interesting places. It just coincidentally took us way up north over the Soviet Union. <laughs> and so we were able to get this photograph of the world's largest lake. This is Lake Baikal in Russia, which is a bit of a sacred lake to the Russians. It's the world's biggest lake. From one end of it to the other is 400 miles. Now, it's also a mile deep because it's at the junction of two of the Earth's tectonic plates. 20% of all the fresh water on Earth is in Lake Baikal. One-fifth of all the fresh water on Earth is in that lake. So coincidentally, since we were up that way, we got to get this photo. Now, to this day, I am not allowed to say what we did except for this much. We launched a major new, and I have to be careful the way I say it as well, um, or I could be in jail. We launched a major new intelligence satellite for the United States, we separated away from it and there was a problem with it. And we had to do an unplanned re-rendezvous and help fix it. And then we separated away and it went on to a completely successful career. And to this day, that was 1988. That's all I'm allowed to say about it. Hopefully, someday I can tell my wife what we did. But to this point, she doesn't know. She does not know other than what I just said. Uh, we were up, this was my shortest mission because after the Challenger accident, we realized, you know what, there were a lot of things we thought we knew, and we thought we were so smart about a lot of things, and we were not. So we went back into flight test mode. So after only four and a half days, I brought Atlantis back and landed it on the lake bed because we had a lot of touchdown, braking, steering, rollout tests that we needed to do because we had not done them adequately prior to the Challenger accident. So that was my shortest flight. Well, this is getting boring, isn't it? Just a couple years later, I got to launch as the commander of Endeavour, and Endeavour was the shuttle that we built to replace Challenger, and this was a science mission. We had the Space Lab laboratory back in the cargo bay, and we were working around the clock. So half of the crew was the red crew, and the other half was the blue crew. So every 12 hours, we'd have a shift change, and this is what we're doing in this picture. Now you'll notice the high-tech method that we use to hold ourselves in one spot. Those little foot loops on the floor. That's all you need. You just need to be able to slip one foot into one of those foot loops, and then you have both hands free to work with or to write with. And you'll notice in this picture, I'm taking notes in a, in a notebook. Well, what's so handy about being weightless is that when I'd finish a page, I'd park my pen right here, flip the page, grab the pen and continue to write. Well, that's really handy, and, but you get in the habit of doing that. And you can see this coming, can't you? We had a crew come back from orbit, 
And there was always a big crowd of people waiting to meet us back in Houston. And one of the astronauts um, named Dale was signing an autograph book. And a nice lady said, hey, would you sign the next page too? And he parked his pen. <laughs> and it's things like that that make people say, geez, these poor guys, it must be lack of oxygen or radiation up there in space <laughs> that fries their brains when they're up in orbit. But nevertheless, it's really handy to work in weightlessness because you can do a lot of things that we can't do down here on the Earth. Oh, I was going to say as well, you notice nobody's wearing shoes. We have no use for shoes. You don't walk anywhere. You fly everywhere you go. So everybody just wears socks uh, when we're up in orbit. Well, we spent eight days on that mission and then landed back at Cape Canaveral. This was the 50th launch of a space shuttle. And one of the really exciting things about being in space is that gorgeous view of the Earth. So just a couple pictures of the Earth. Also on my top secret mission, we were up north far enough to get this pretty picture of Greenland. The world's largest island is what Greenland is. And on my fourth mission, we got this photo of the delta of the Nile River. Now under the tail of the orbiter, you can see the Suez Canal. And on the right side of the picture, that's the Mediterranean Sea. So that's north. And the Suez Canal flows from the Mediterranean into the Red Sea to the left of the picture. And I don't know if you can really make it out. Right at the tip of the delta is the city of Cairo, Egypt. And the bright spot, the white spots in the sand right there at the tip of the delta, those are the pyramids. So you can see them from orbit if you know right where to look. Now, what do you suppose this might look like at night? Looks pretty spectacular at night. So not only do we get to enjoy this beautiful view of the Earth in the daytime, we get to see it at night as well. And in this picture, you can see there's a lot of civilization along the Nile River and in the Delta, because we humans need water very badly. You move off the Nile River a little bit, and there isn't much out there. And if you look way off to the left in the photo, there's a bunch of lights over there. I have no clue who that is out there. But you guys sure are out there by yourselves. There must be an oasis or something out there. Either that or they truck in all the water they need. So I'm not sure what it is. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you, though, by far the prettiest thing we get to see from space. And I was talking to a bunch of fifth grade classes one day, and I said, OK, the next slide is the prettiest thing we see from orbit. And one of the kids shouted, Las Vegas. <laughs> no, not Las Vegas, the aurora. And not only do we get to see the one we're most familiar with, the northern lights, the aurora borealis, there's also the southern lights, the aurora australis. And these are both rings of light around the poles of the Earth. Now, you can see in this picture, we're up above it because the aurora is an upper atmosphere effect. And we're up above the atmosphere. So we wind up looking down at the aurora from space. But it is just fascinating to get to watch it. So again, a really intriguing view of the Earth that we get to have from orbit. Well, for my final mission, we got to train over here. My crew and I, uh, five of us, trained in Russia uh, twice because we're going to do the very first docking with the Russians that was ever done by a space shuttle. In fact, it was the very first docking ever done by a space shuttle. I had been the chief astronaut at the time, and I wasn't about to assign myself to do that mission because it was such a plum mission. But the higher-ups at NASA said, OK, the Russians are nervous, and so we've got to calm their fears, and so you, the chief astronaut, have got to go command this mission. So I'm glad I got to do it, although, although I fought it, because your job as a leader is not to skim off the good deals for yourself, it's to share them with your boys and girls. But I got forced to go do it, and I'm glad I got to do it, because it was really an exciting mission, even though I fought it for quite a while. Well, in this photo, this is the 10 of us that would be involved. Three of them would launch aboard a Russian rocket in March of 1995. And then the seven of us, five Americans and two Russians, would launch aboard Atlantis in June of 1995. Now in this photo, after all those years of being a, an American fighter pilot, training to shoot down Russian fighter pilots, I'm sitting in between two Russian MiG pilots who had been training to shoot down and kill me all those years. 
and now I have to pretend like I like these godless communists. Well, I do like them. We got to know them, we got to work with them, we got to fly in space with them, and they're just like us. They love flying, they love space flight, they're really good guys. I'm not sure all their managers are the same, but the cosmonauts themselves were just great guys to work with. So here we are launching. Now when we launched, I had two Russians on board with me, Anatoly Soloviev and Nikolai Budarin, and they couldn't speak English. So my crew and I had to attempt, underline the word attempt, to learn to speak Russian. And the reason I say that is that I are an engineer. Engineers ain't talk good in English, let alone in Russian. And so anytime I'm going to talk to somebody in Russian, I will start off by telling them this. Yagovaryu Peruski, Ochimpoha i Panimayo Nichevo. I speak Russian very badly and understand nothing. <laughs> but as I mentioned, during the launch, I have two Russians on board with me. And if I need to tell them something like, Isvanicha Pajalista, Unas Yes Malyenki Pojar Nabortu Priamos Ichas. Excuse me, please. We have a small fire on board right now. <laughs> so we, we really needed to be able to speak Russian, and I am not fluent in Russian, but I remember just enough probably to get in trouble trying to, trying to speak Russian. Well, here's the Russian space station Mir. Mir is a Russian word that has two meanings. It means world, and it also means peace. And where I docked Atlantis was the upper right corner to a module called Kristall. And it had a docking port that the Russians had intended for their space shuttle to go to and dock with, but it never went there. They launched their space shuttle one time, completely unmanned. It flew around the Earth twice and landed, never flew again. The Soviet Union fell apart shortly after that, and they didn't have the blank check to fly the, their shuttle, so it never flew again. So we bought the portion of the docking mechanism, which you can just make out in the forward part of the cargo bay, it's about a four-foot diameter ring. And what I had to do, this is all flown manually by the commander. So at about, we're flying um, on, on, com on computer-generated burns into about three miles to go. And then at three miles to go, the commander will get out of his seat and he'll move back to, let's see, the commander, he will. Uh, did we have women commanders on the space shuttle? Yes, of course we did. Yes, of course we did. So about three miles to go, he or she would get out of their seat and move to the aft windows and fly the approach manually. So docking, rendezvous and docking in our program was always done manually by the commander. In the Russian program, it was automated. So this was one of those really exciting challenges because I had to line the centers of the two rings up within three inches. They said, Hoot, you can be sloppy. You just got to line them up within three inches. And the contact velocity had to be one-tenth of a foot per second. One-tenth of a foot per second. Let's see, that's 1.2 inches per second. And they said, if you hit them at two-tenths of an inch per second, you'll break the mechanism. And the day before launch, we had a telecon with the NASA administrator. And at the end of the telecon, he said, okay, Hoot, no pressure now. But I want you to know that while you're docking, there will be five billion people watching you on television. <laughs> so no pressure. Okay, I've, I've given it all this buildup because this makes me sound really good. Well, it came off flawlessly because we had done probably a hundred dockings in training in the, in the simulators. And so it just came off flawlessly. Now the plan was once we got there, the two mission commanders are to shake hands. So in this photo, I'm shaking hands with Russian MiG-29 pilot, Colonel Vladimir Dezhurov, who was one of those Russian MiG pilots, and the President of the United States announced this day that this handshake marks the end of the Cold War. So now you all realize I ended the Cold War. <laughs> it makes a funny story. Well, we got to spend five days aboard the Mir space station. We could go anywhere on Mir. The Russians could go anywhere in the shuttle because we had trained on each other's systems. So they knew which door not to open. We knew which windows not to open. And five days later, when it was time to leave, 
the way we got this photograph, Anatoly and Nikolai, who are staying behind for five months, climbed into Soyuz, which is their little Apollo capsule, if you will, three-person capsule, and undocked and moved out to the side 60 meters away, or 200 feet away, so they could take photos of us leaving. I thought it was crazy, because we had two vehicles in orbit that need to not run together. Let's throw another one into the mix, too. <laughs> So I thought it was, it was kind of a wacky idea, but anyway, NASA said, okay, sure. So we did it, and we got away with it. It worked out okay. And that's the picture right before undocking, and here we are on our way out. And we stayed in orbit after we undocked from the station for two more days, getting ready to come back and land. And during re-entry, I'm sure many of you know, this is what the shuttle would look like. This is a wind tunnel model uh, simulating a Mach 25 re-entry. And you can see we create this enormous shock wave around the orbiter. And the temperature in that shock wave is about 9,000 degrees. And from inside the shuttle, this is what it looks like during re-entry. It looks like you're flying into a blowtorch, only it's twice as hot as an oxyacetylene blowtorch. And it lasts for 15 minutes during re-entry. So launch is exciting, re-entry is exciting as well. Because uh, like I say, you fly all the way down to Mach 10, surrounded by fire. Once we're slow, Mach 10 and below, then, then we, don't have, we don't have all the heating. And so as you know, we landed like an airplane on the runway. Only you're a 230,000 pound glider, and you have exactly 1.0 opportunities to land it. So we trained our pilots and our commanders very, very extensively to make the landing because you couldn't go into holding, you couldn't make a touch and go, you couldn't back up and do it over again. So we trained very, very extensively for the landing. And then if you've done everything right and you survived it, you get to have cool hero photos taken like this one out in front of the orbiter. Well, all those years that I was an astronaut, I'd be interviewed by a television or radio show or whatever, and they'd say, hey, is there anything in the world of aviation that you haven't done that you want to do? The answer was always, yes. I would dearly love to race the unlimited class at Reno. And the unlimited class in the Reno Air Races is just what the name says. It's unlimited, any piston engine airplane. You could race a DC-7 if you wanted to, uh, it, it got done years ago when it was a long distance race, but around the pylons at Reno, I don't think a DC-7 would do well. But it's any piston engine. And so in 1998, I got asked by a friend, would you like to race my Hawker Sea Fury at Reno? And this was an airplane that had an R3350 in it, so 3,000 horsepower, 18-cylinder, twin-row, right cyclone engine. And I said, how much do I have to pay you? And he said, no, I just want you to race it. Um, he was going to race it himself. But his wife said, oh, no, you're not. That's too dangerous. And so he regrouped and he said, how about if we find somebody expendable? Somebody, somebody we could never possibly get attached to, and we'll have him race it for us. So that's where I came in. So I got to race that airplane called Riff Raff for 10 years, from 1998 through 2009, raced it, and air racing is not the most sane thing in the world to be doing. This is how we'd start a race. We line up on a pace plane, and you can see to the very right side of the image, the pace plane is a T-33 jet, because these are the world's fastest piston engine airplanes, and we would race as many as nine airplanes at one time. And the pace plane would lead us down to the race course and about two miles prior to the guide pylon, he'd call out and say, okay, the guide pylon is at my 12 o'clock, gentlemen, you look good, gentlemen, you have a race. And then he pitches up and he's out of there because he's not crazy. He's not going down there. Well, here's where we race. It's down close to the ground. Now, in this picture, Jimmy Leeward and I are having a knockdown drag out battle and I'm trying to pass him and I'm climbing all over him. Jimmy, by the way, was the pilot that was killed in that tragedy in 2011 when his Mustang went out of control and he wound up crashing into the crowd. But this is where we fly, and at 
In this photo, we had just finished what's called the Valley of Speed, which is a little bit of a straightaway. You still never quite go wings level because you're going so fast. Jimmy and I in this picture are probably doing about 460 miles an hour. Now the rule for minimum altitude is my helmet must not be below the top of that pylon, which I see as a reasonable rule. I don't think I need to be any lower than Jimmy and I are in this photo, but that's the rule for minimum altitude. Uh, raced that airplane for 10 years and managed, we started out in the middle of the pack and then wound up finishing up in the gold final, uh, fourth place finishes three years in a row, and then that inconsiderate owner sold it. And so then I had to find another Sea Fury. Well, I got approached by another guy that owned a Sea Fury and asked if I would race his airplane. And this was race number 232. And I raced that airplane for four years. And it blew up its engine three out of the four years that I raced it. So I'm really good at dead stick landings. Um, I have 15 of them all together, not counting the space shuttles all due to air racing, really. And uh, so three of the four years that I raced this airplane, I blew up the engine. Uh, the one year I didn't blow it up, I got second place overall in the unlimited championship. So that had been my best finish. Okay, all of our North American guys, you've been waiting all day for me to shut up and talk about a Mustang. After I blew that airplane up the third time, the owner said, you know, I'm tired of buying new motors for you, so I'm selling the airplane. And at that point, Bill DeStefani, who owned this airplane called Strega, which means witch in Italian, had been bugging me for three years. When are you going to come race Strega? Well, I knew I could win the championship because that is the hot airplane out there but I was tied to the other team and I wasn't going to bail out on my team. There's a thing called loyalty out there. Well, once I blew up the motor the third time, he called me the very next day and said, okay, now there's nothing keeping you from racing Strega, right? <laughs> and I said, yes. And I'm really glad I got to race a Mustang. Uh, you can see in this picture, the wings have been clipped. So it has a smaller wingspan than a stock Mustang. And I went out to fly it the first time, and I said, OK, I need to know what the no-flap stall speed of this thing is. I was really surprised. It was 90 miles per hour, even with a clipped wing. Well, and the reason is, everything that weighs anything in that airplane has been stripped out. So it's greatly reduced in weight over a stock Mustang. So 90 miles an hour was the clean stall speed of that airplane. Surprised the daylights out of me. Now, this is a picture taken of the Sea Fury 232, and you can just barely see the engines turning in this one. Can you see what I can see out of this cockpit? <laughs> you can't see squat out of this cockpit. It is just a real bear to taxi this airplane around, and you can't see anything out of it. And on takeoff at full throttle, I can't see the runway ahead of me until I get the tail up. And that doesn't happen until about 70 knots. So you're making a blind takeoff in that thing. I can just barely see the two edges of the runway out the sides. And so that was exciting. Compare that to this. You can actually see out of a Mustang. So it was just a pleasure to fly. Just a, a really neat airplane to fly. So what do you have to do to make a Mustang fast enough to win in the unlimited class? A lot. There's a lot that gets done to it. In this picture, you can see there's a little tiny bubble canopy on it because the great big P-51D canopy is a lot of drag. And you don't need to be able to see behind you. You don't really need to see a whole lot. So little tiny bubble canopy. You can see the air scoop underneath the wing as well is greatly reduced in size. And I'm gonna show another picture of that air scoop in just a second. But the next picture, okay, this isn't just a cool photo to show me in my racing suit, but look at the surface finish on the airplane. The wings and the fuselage and everything has been puttied up and sanded and polished to a mirror finish because at 500 miles an hour, Aerodynamic drag is huge, and so you've got to really do a lot of stuff to it. You can just barely see the fairing behind me towards the bottom of the picture that's been added on to streamline the flow coming off the bottom of the wing as well. I mentioned the air scoop underneath. You can see how tiny that thing is. 
So it's been shrunk way down because every bit of air, as you all know, every bit of air that you take in and own for a while and then get rid of it, it's called drag. So you want to take in as little air as you possibly can. Well, then the engine would overheat. Okay, so what the airplane employed was a water, a water spray system that sprays water on the radiator, which is for the oil cooler and the coolant for the, for the liquid cooled Merlin, Rolls-Royce Merlin. Now that presents an interesting challenge as well. Uh, you can see the little trail of, of spray, steam and water that the airplane leaves behind it. And in this picture, you can see if it's a humid day, the canopy fogs up. And when I was making my, my qual run around the pylon, cockpit totally fogged up. Hope nobody from the FAA is here. Totally fogged up, and I'm wiping the windscreen with my hand so that I can see the ground so as not to hit it, making my qual run. And it fogged up like this in the Saturday heat race, although not my windscreen. So I was able to see okay in the Saturday heat race. Now, air racing is also described as uncooperative formation flying. <laughs> and when we first got to Reno, it had a brand new racing motor in the Mustang, and it had not seated itself yet. So it wasn't putting out full power. So I qualified second behind Rare Bear, which I'm chasing in this photo, and I couldn't get past him in the Friday heat race, but on the Saturday heat race, thank goodness, that engine finally seated in, and I passed him to win the Saturday race, which put me on the pole for the final race on Sunday, which is the championship, the gold, the gold championship race. Now these airplanes, these engines, are kind of like a dragster motor. You make one hard run on that engine and they're gonna tear into it and take a good solid look at it. The valve covers are gonna come off, they're gonna go all through the valve train, make sure nothing is broken, make sure you haven't broken any of the head bolts that fasten the heads to the engine. And there have been, I don't know if it's aluminum angle iron or what, uh, welded to the sides of the case because at the power rating that we're running these things at, Ace would tend to flex too much and it would cause the engine to come apart. And so there's a lot of modifications. It turns out that the Rolls-Royce connecting rods are not strong enough. You have to put Allison connecting rods in the engine because they'll tolerate the power setting that we're going to fly these things at. In World War II, the Mustang at full throttle would pull 60 inches of manifold pressure. If you broke through the copper wire guard, you went into war emergency, and that was 67 inches of manifold pressure. I was running 128 inches of manifold pressure. So the engine was putting out probably 3,000 horsepower when it was originally designed for 1900. So if it'll hold together for eight laps, you're probably going to win. And if it doesn't, you're going to make another dead stick landing. Well, in my case, it all held together. So this was the lineup for the championship race. You can see the pilots are in the airplane getting ready, getting ready to get started. Uh, I was on the pole in Strega. Voodoo was number two, and then Rare Bear, then a bunch of Sea Furies after that to make out the final race. This was the start, and Voodoo is all over me because uh, these are almost identical airplanes. Same clipped wings, same shrunk down air scoop on the bottom, same totally souped up Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. That was the start of the race. This was the end of the first lap, and you can see he's hanging all over me. And this was as close as he ever got to me, though. Uh, from that point on, I gradually started to pull away from him. And by the fourth lap, I was far enough out in front that the crew chief called up and said, OK, first power reduction. Come back to 125 inches, all the way back to 125 inches. And then a lap later, he called up and said, OK, 120 inches. And then the next lap, he said, OK, come back to 110 inches, and you can open the coolant door a little wider, and you don't need to hug the pylons quite as tight. At that point, I can tell I'm, I'm way out in front. In fact, I lapped everybody in the field except for the second place airplane. And this photo is just a brilliant photo. Anthony Taylor is the photographer that took this picture. And you'll notice the airplane is in razor-sharp focus 
the pylon is blurred. Once again, top of that pylon's 30 feet. So I'm, I don't know what, 60 feet in this picture. I like to get close to the pylons because uh, that way you can really tell I am outside the pylon because if so much as your wingtip crosses the top of that pylon, that's a pylon cut. And a pylon cut will cost you four seconds times the number of laps. And the championship race was eight laps. So that's 32 seconds for one pylon cut. That'll move you from first place to last place. So you don't want any cuts. Okay, the next picture is a real happy photo because even though I took the checkered flag and came back and landed, you don't know that you've necessarily won until you hear from the contest committee. And I had just climbed out of the airplane onto the wing when the announcer came up on the, on the PA for the grandstand and announced, okay, the contest committee said we had a clean race, so we have a new national and world champion, Hoot Gibson. And so everybody started a product just like now. You're giving me goosebumps. Anyway, this was when I first was sure, okay, I, I really did win the championship. And this was also the first time in seven years that Voodoo had not won, or I should say that Stephen Hinton had not won the championship. Um, I climbed down off the wing and the first thing they do is they put the gold jacket on you, which the winner of the gold class in each of the different divisions, so the Formula Ones, the biplanes, the T6s, and the Unlimiteds, the winner of the gold championship race gets a gold jacket, and they handed me the permanent trophy. I didn't get to keep this one, but they handed me the permanent trophy and shot just what is a real happy photo as well. Now, my last slide, finally, he's gonna shut up. My last slide, the final picture is a poster that one of my buddies made up for me and sent it to me, and it's kind of funny. And, and, and what that's... <laughs> what that's reflecting is the fact that the first lap, um, I averaged 503 miles an hour in the first lap, and that photo that I just showed coming by the pylon, which was such a sharp, crisp photo of the airplane and a blurred pylon, I averaged 498 in that lap. So I actually set a speed record for the eight lap final race. 488.9 miles an hour was my average. And halfway through the race, I had started throttling back. So it's too bad voodoo wasn't all over me the whole race. I could have had maybe closer to 500 miles an hour. Okay, don't whine hoot. I guess it was okay as it was. Anyway, uh, to this day, I hold the speed record for the course. And this was back in 2015. And I called Bill DeStefani several months later. I was whining to this earlier to Pete Law that I called, I called Bill DeStefani because he was all excited the day after we won because uh, the prize money was really big and I don't take any of that. I'm doing this for the fun of it. Anyway, um, he was all excited and he said, Hooter, we're going to be back next year. We're going to have a brand new racing motor. We're going to have a spare racing motor. We're going to be even faster. And then I called him two months later to double check. And he said, Hooter, I'm too old and you're too old. I'm going to have a younger pilot from now on. Well, I've been told that I'm the oldest person that ever won the Unlimited Championship. Probably true, Pete. Yeah, I'm the oldest person that ever won the unlimited championship, but I still hold the speed record for the course, but I'm too old, go figure. So, but it's his airplane, and I guess he gets to pick who gets to race it, and apparently it's not me. And one of my buddies, well, the guy that owned Riff Raff, the first Sea Fury that I raced, when I was whining to him about this, said, well, you know what, he might have just saved your life. Uh, because 44% of those 18 years I raced at Reno, we killed a pilot. So it isn't the safest thing in the world to be doing. But you know what? Hey, if you've got to replace a rocket for excitement, what are you going to do? It's going to take, it's going to take something like the Reno Air Races. So with that, can we do questions? Uh, the question was, how old was I when I won the championship? Okay, it was four years ago, and I was 69 years old. 
when I won the championship. So. Now everybody knows that later this month I'm going to be 73. God, I never wanted to be this old, but I guess that's okay. Question from my test pilot school commanding officer, Bob Johnson, is how old could you fly with Southwest? I got to fly after I was an astronaut. I went to work for Southwest as a pilot because I wasn't tired of flying yet. And I flew for, flew for 10 years with Southwest and then I got gobbled up by age 60. Uh, so when I turned 60 is when I had to stop flying. Now I had been advocating for the age limit to be raised to 65 because the rest of the world was 65. Uh, but we in the US were 60. They raised it to 65, but 13 months after, it was too late for me. Um, but that's okay. Going into it, I said, okay, I probably have 10 years to do this. And that's what I had was 10 years uh, to get to be an airline pilot. And I really enjoyed the flying. You know, after flying jet fighters, you wouldn't think that flying a big trash hauler like that um, would be fun. But it was, and your, one of your big challenges was you were gonna make people feel like they're sitting in their living room, is what you were gonna do. You were gonna fly it as smoothly and as precisely as you possibly could. And I found that an exciting challenge. So I really enjoyed my time with Southwest Airlines. Good question. Uh, Darren, whose Mustang we have here, asked, when you're going around those pylons, are you on the verge of a high-speed stall? Uh, going around going around the race course. The answer is no, the airplane had plenty of lift, and in any event, as you know from the Mustang, you'd be able to feel the buffet, and so you'd know that you were approaching the stall. But no, even at the G level that I was pulling. Now, um, I don't wear a G-suit, because there isn't a system in the airplane to, to pump the G-suit, and I don't look at the G-meter going around the race course because there's much more important things for you to be looking at, like the ground, the pylon, other airplanes. Um, but the G-meter in Strega, whenever I finished one of the heat races, would be six to six and a half Gs. But as the, shoot, as the fighter pilots that are here know, once you build up a tolerance to pulling Gs like that, you don't, you don't so much notice it. So, um, I was never close to graying out or, or blacking out, certainly, uh, in it, and you were never close to stall even at six, six and a half Gs. Great question. Great question. When did I go to test pilot school? That was from June of 1976 to June of 1977. And uh, my, my test pilot school class two years ago had a 40-year reunion. 40 years? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We had a 40-year reunion, and that was, that was the hardest, I, honest it was, Skipper, that was the hardest I ever worked in my entire life. Going through college in aeronautical engineering was not as challenging. Astronaut training was not nearly as challenging. Training in the Phantom and the Tomcat was not as challenging. Test pilot school was the most challenging year, uh, but it was also the most productive and the huge, huge big payback from getting that experience and that, and that degree. When did I go to Pensacola was the next question. I went there, I went there on June the 24th, 1969, was the day I reported to Aviation Officer Candidate School. Uh, I was commissioned um, 50 years ago, two days ago, October the 17th, was when I got through, thank you. And then, um, and then I got my wings January the 29th of 71, and then went to the F-4 Phantom. There was another question over here somewhere. Yes, sir. Well, okay, the question was, after I was informed that I'm too old to race, uh, the airplane didn't race the next year because uh, it needed some engine repairs from what I had done to it. And, and let the record show that after you finish racing it for a whole week in Reno, you're going to fly it across the Sierras back to California to get it back to Bakersfield. So I flew it across the Sierras the way that it was needing repair, uh, which was I had cracked the accessory case and the, uh, the pan, the engine pan, and two of the cylinder sleeves were cracked. And that's how I flew it home. But it worked, it worked just fine. 
Um, work just fine getting it home. And let's see, what was your question now that I babbled about that? Yes, how well did the replacement pilot do? Well, he, he won the championship two years later in 2017. He actually won the championship. Um, he, he made a move, or he didn't make a move, that cost him the lead in the gold final race right at the very start, which I wouldn't have made. And so he wound up playing catch up, but luckily, Strega is the fastest airplane out there, and by the finish line, he caught up and passed him, just barely passed him at the finish. So he wound up winning. So, see, Tiger was right. He needed a younger pilot. <laughs> Question is, how, how close am I to the pylons when you're going around? Well, you want to be as close to them as you can possibly manage, because if you're far enough outside, you're flying a greater distance around the course. And the course is 8.1 8 miles around. And in Strega, I was doing that in 55 seconds. So yeah, just over 500 miles an hour. Now, I like to be down low because picture this. If I'm, if I'm up high and I'm looking down at the pylon, OK, am I really outside the pylon? Or am I just barely over the pylon? Or even worse, am I inside the pylon? If I'm down low, I can really gauge I can really gauge where that pylon is, and I can ensure that I am not that I am not cutting the pylon. And so, in the unlimiteds, in all those uh, years of racing, I never had a pylon cut. And so, part of it is I like to get down where I can just see it and know for sure uh, that I'm not cutting that pylon. How close are you to another airplane, uh, was the next question. Well, you saw that one photo of me climbing all over Rare Bear, and I've had a number of races like that, and the pilot of that airplane is Stu Dawson, who's a dear friend of mine that I've raced against for a great many years. And maybe to put in context how close you are to it, his wife, after the race, said to me, you make me nervous. But then she said, but I'm really glad that it's you flying so close to my husband. So that was a bit of a compliment. So yeah, you will be, if you're trying to pass somebody, uh, you've got to be as close as you can get to him because if you're outside, you're flying a longer course around the race course and you're not going to pass him. So, so you've, you've got to be close to him. Way back in the back. The question had to do with the atmosphere control system on the shuttle. Um, which we called ECLIS, uh, Environmental Control Life Support System, uh, is what it was called. We stayed at sea level pressure. So unlike an airliner where your ears pop when you go up in altitude, we stay right at sea level. So your ears never pop. So it's really easy on you. The only time you don't stay at sea level pressure is if, if you're going to send some of your mission specialists outside for a spacewalk to make tolerance to the bends easier, we'll take the cabin down to 10.2 PSI instead of 14.7. So there's an automatic system that flows nitrogen or oxygen. Once we put it in automatic mode, it will look at what's the cabin pressure. Okay, it's 14.5. So I need to flow something. Am I light on oxygen or am I light on nitrogen? and it'll flow whichever one it needs to. So it keeps it right at that 14.7. And then we have, uh, we have uh, water, um, a water loop, set of water loops that circulate water around in the cabin, and the cabin fan is cooled by the water. So we can set the temperature to anything we want to set it to in the cabin. So the environmental system works, works beautifully in the shuttle. Yeah, the question is, can I talk about the tile damage that I saw on STS-27? Now, this, this never made the news very much, I think because we were a top secret classified mission. But on the second day of the flight, after we had dropped off our major new intelligence satellite, mission control called us and said, hey guys, uh, we saw something hit your right wing during launch. Does this sound like Columbia? Yeah, it sounds just like what happened to Columbia. We saw something hit your right wing, and we want you to take a look with the robot arm 
that has a TV camera on the end of it. Take a look at your right wing and tell us what you see. And I'll never forget when we positioned the arm and brought up the view on the camera to myself, I said, we are going to die. Uh, turned out we had 707 damaged tiles on the right wing. We couldn't see it from the angle that we were, but we had lost one tile entirely on the underside. And so we asked, well, we told Mission Control, well, uh, hey, Houston, we're seeing a lot of damage on the right wing. Well, Department of Defense, because this was such a highly classified mission, didn't want any television coming down at all. And they finally relented and said, okay, we'll let them send encrypted television down. So we sent encrypted TV down. Well, encrypted TV, it shoots a frame, takes about three seconds to encrypt it and send it another frame, three seconds, another frame. So the resolution that they saw on the ground was so poor that they looked at it and they said, well, who's a dummy? That's not tile damage. These are just lights and shadows that he's seeing. What are they forgetting? They're forgetting that on board, I am not looking at encrypted TV. I'm looking at clear TV on board. So we had a magnificent failure to communicate on the part of mission control. They never came back and said to me, we don't think you're seeing tile damage. We think you're just seeing lights and shadows. Because at that point, I would have said, okay, I'm sending you clear TV. They never came back and said that. What they came back with was after about a day of analyzing it, they came back and they said, okay, hoot, it's no problem, just re-enter like usual. And I keyed the mic and I said, Dave, Dave Hilmers was the Capcom. And I said, Dave, what are they basing this on? And he said, stand by, so he had to get the answer to that question. And he came back and he said, hoot, it's no worse than what we've seen on any other mission. And I'm sitting there going, so I keyed the mic and I said, well, Dave, you know, I've been here since before STS-1 and I have never seen anything like this before. And then I acquiesced, which I shouldn't have done. I said, okay, but you guys are the experts, so okay. But I didn't believe it. And I guess one of the reasons that I did that, which was dumb, was that there had been crews in the past that got into a big fight with mission control and I didn't want to come across as fighting with mission control, and so I shut up where I probably should not have shut up. So all the way down during re-entry, I'm watching the flight controls, because I knew what I'd see, which was what we saw in the case of Columbia. If we started to burn through on the right wing, then we would see the left elevon going down to create more drag on that side to make up for it, the right elevon going up, and if I saw that during the re-entry, I figured I probably have 30 seconds to tell mission control what I think. And so in the audio tape that I have of our re-entry, about every two minutes, I would announce to the crew, okay, the controls look good. All the way down, all the way down, I was, I was reading off what the flight controls were. We got on the ground and they looked at it and they went, holy smokes, why didn't you guys tell us about this? <laughs> and so I, I asked the, uh, well, I asked the lead flight director, uh, the ascent and entry flight director in our debrief, I said, well, uh, Gary, uh, what if you guys had believed us? What could we have done about it? And he said, I don't know. So anyway, that's the way it stood all the way up to Columbia. And of course, we lost Columbia for just about exactly the same thing. Wait, way back in the back. Yes, sir. Okay, the question was, how important was model aviation in my aviation career? It was, I think, very instrumental in my aviation and career. Um, and I'll give you one example. I had, I had built a big glider one time, and, and it always annoyed me to have to put nose weight on it to get the CG in the right place. But as we know, Center of gravity has got to be in the right place or you have an unstable airplane, an unstable model. And so there was one time I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna make the nose really long out of the same wood that the body's made out of and that way I won't have to add any weight to it. It flew horribly. And the reason was it had so much inertia in the pitch axis 
that it would get into a, a fugoid oscillation and it wouldn't fly. And I figured out, oh, you know what? The dynamics are important as well. The aerodynamics are important, but also the flight dynamics of it are important. So I learned a lot from doing model airplanes, and I'm still doing them. I'm still doing model airplanes and uh, radio-controlled jets, electric jets. I'm too lazy to do the turbines. Um, and the electric ducted fans sound just like a jet, jet engine, and they fly great. I have an F4 Phantom painted up just like my F4 Phantom that I showed you the picture of. I have an F14 Tomcat painted up just like my Tomcat. And I made a model that's really ambitious, the Convair XFY1 Pogo, that stands about, oh golly, stands about this tall. So stands about uh, three and a half, four feet tall. I have flown it on a tether, hovered it on about a six inch tether, so I've got enough power. I'm just not convinced I have enough flight control. Uh, so I'm still involved in, in radio control modeling. And it's, it's been a lot of fun and it's been very instructive. If I could do anything again, what would it be? I would love to go back to space again. I wasn't tired of it. Um, my wife was ready to move back to Houston after my fourth mission, but right after my fourth mission, they promoted me to chief astronaut. And so I wasn't going to walk away from that job. So we stayed thinking, okay, we'll be here for another year or two, and then they made me go do the mirror docking. And so we wound up staying for another year or two. And so she was ready to go back to her hometown of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She made three missions aboard the space shuttles as a mission specialist. And so I would love to go back to space again. I'd love to go to the moon, but you know what they're gonna say? They're gonna say, who? You're too old. So, and, and also, haven't you had your turn? Didn't you already get to go five times? Haven't you been greedy enough? And the answer is yes, but I'd still love to go again. Okay, the question was, when I was a Southwest Airlines pilot, how many of the passengers figured out that their co-pilot or their captain was, a, was an astronaut, most of the time they wouldn't figure it out. And of course, when I met a new crew, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't something that I'd say to the flight attendants or to the captain I was flying with, but I was rather well known at Southwest, so they pretty well knew who I was. And sometimes the flight attendants would get on the PA system once we were up in the air and say, I'll bet you didn't know that our captain was a space shuttle mission commander. And people would get a big kick out of that. And, and it, would, it would clutter up us unboarding the aircraft. Uh, <laughs> because frequently I got to sign autographs and things like that. So, but it was really fun. And as I mentioned earlier, I really enjoyed the time I, I did with Southwest Airlines. What did I fly? All the models of the Boeing 737. The 737-200s, 300s, 500s, and 700s. And this was before the 800s and before the Max 8, so I had not, had not flown either of those. The question was, having raced both the, the Sea Fury and the Mustang, uh, which one did I like the flight characteristics of better and which one was more enjoyable to race? The Sea Fury was a big, strong, powerful airplane and very, very robust, but also very, very heavy. And I showed the photo earlier of the field of view that I don't have out of the cockpit. And so the Mustang was a lot more pleasant to fly. It was a lot easier to fly. Uh, it was also a lot faster. But the engine was really being stressed in the Mustang. And I think I mentioned earlier, if the engine will hold together for eight laps, um, you're probably going to win. Well, many, many times the, the Merlin doesn't hold together for eight laps. And some of those years that I got fourth place in, the earlier Sea Fury, happened because all the Mustangs blew up. And I watched Tiger, our Bill to Stephanie, I watched him blow up three years in a row, uh, went back when he was flying Strega. So, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses about both of them. The flying qualities, of the Mustang were easier to manage because it's a much smaller, lighter airplane. And the Sea Fury had a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia. One thing you didn't want to do was get the Sea Fury taxiing fast and have to stop suddenly. 
because you could put it on its nose. You could very easily put it on its nose. Question was, were all the Mustangs Merlin engines? Uh, I believe the answer to that is yes. I don't think anyone ever tried to race one with the Allison uh, because they didn't have quite as much power. And uh, if you were really serious about racing, you, you did all the things that I mentioned uh, to the Merlin to, to put out 3,000 horsepower instead of 1,900. Uh, question was, how did I happen to choose the college that I graduated from, California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California? Well, I moved around a lot because my dad was an FAA test pilot. And when I was in my second year of community college on Long Island, New York, on a snowy, icy winter day, I was looking for a place to transfer to on my third year. And I was in the library and I found a, a brochure for California, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. And I looked through it and they had aeronautical engineering and I saw that we had our own runway there. And I was thinking, okay, snow and ice, California, that's it. Um, and Cal Poly just has an excellent reputation for engineering and agriculture and architecture. Uh, and it was just an excellent, excellent school to go to. The comment was, it's a party school. Well, my comment to that is, when you're majoring in aeronautical engineering, you don't have no time for partying. And, uh, you know, on the weekends, you didn't have time for fraternities. On the weekends, you were writing lab reports for your stress analysis lab and things of that nature. So I didn't get to do that much partying, yeah, honestly. Okay, what plane have I not flown that I would love to fly? Anybody that's got any connections out there, I would love to get to fly an F-16. Never got to fly one but I would just dearly love to get to fly an F-16. I've flown, let's see, the F-14, the F-18, two models of the F-18, um, the F-4 Phantom, the F-101 Voodoo, the F-86s, obviously. Altogether, my airplane list, I didn't know how many airplanes I had flown, but about five years ago, Air and Space Smithsonian Magazine put me on their cover. And they said, hey, on our website, we want to put down how many airplanes you've flown. We want to make a list. And I said, I don't know how many I've flown. They said, well, make us a list. So I made a list back then, and since then, I've kept it up. And so now it's 159 different airplanes. Um, so, so, yeah, I've been, I've been really lucky and really spoiled all the way in the back. The question is, would I like to get behind the controls of an F-22 Raptor? Of course I would. Yeah, of course I would. <laughs> Um, I don't think they have a two-seater, so they're probably not going to invite me because what are they going to tell me to? You're too old. Yeah, they're going to tell me I'm too old, so I probably won't get to do that. Yes, sir. How many missions did I fly in Vietnam and did I ever get into any air-to-air -air combat? Uh, answer is I flew a total of 56 combat missions, most of them in 1972. I had one mission that was titled a combat mission, although it really wasn't. In the Tomcats, in 1975, we covered the evacuation of Saigon. So I flew combat air patrol over Saigon the day that Saigon fell, April the 30th, 1975. It really wasn't combat. They weren't shooting at us. They just wanted to let us go ahead and get our people and get on out of there. Uh, so altogether, 56 missions. But the majority of them, because this was 1972, and we canceled the bombing halt that had been in place since 1968. Most of those were over the north. So I went to Hanoi and Haiphong and went up to the Chinese border, not quite to the Chinese border, um, and Happy Valley and all those kinds of places. So I was a 25-year-old fighter pilot then, and this was my first cruise. And I'll never forget when I flew off the carrier and landed back in Miramar, my dad, who was the one who had taught me how to fly, walked up to me and gave me a big hug and said, you will never know how for the last six months I wished I had never taught you to fly. And I guess I'll just never forget that. It just, it just chokes me up any time I think about it. Okay, what kind of airplane do I own and fly? I think I interpret your question as. Um, I, own, I own a Beechcraft Bonanza, an old V-tailed H30, H, uh, H55 model uh, from 1957, and I also own a, and have been flying since, uh, 
March the 1st, 1984, a Formula One racer. Uh, started life as a cassette, and over the years I have modified it so many times that it's now more of a Gibson. It has a different bubble canopy on it. I designed and built a uh, carbon fiber and fiberglass wing for it that's a much more efficient wing than the stock wing that's on them. And with that wing, the performance was so much better that I set two world records um, in my little home-built cassette. Uh, one was a world altitude record in 1991 of 27,000 feet using a, uh, a Cessna 150 engine, uh, 0200, 100 horsepower, got it up to 27,040 feet, got a world altitude record in it. And then in 2004, I broke the world's 100 kilometer close course speed record in it to break a record that had stood for 20 years. And so people ask me, what's your favorite airplane? That's one of my favorite airplanes, is my, my little home built. The other one, surprisingly, is the Russian MiG-21. What a fun airplane that thing is. And uh, it's, it's a lightweight fighter. It takes two minutes to crank that thing up, go through all the checks you need to go through, and taxi. And so it's a real hot rod. I really have enjoyed it. I didn't fly it as an adversary. I flew it in air shows. And I also had flown a MiG-15 in air shows, and I really enjoyed that airplane as well. Uh, but when we do a simulated Korean War dogfight against an F-86, I always got shot down. Because it had to end that way. We weren't going to let me shoot down the F-86, even though I could have. But, <laughs> We had a smoke system in the MiG, and so when we had, dog, had finished dogfighting for long enough, I would flip on the smoke system and come back in and make an emergency landing. It's a little bit hokey, but, but it was a lot of fun uh, flying in air shows. The question was, do I have a comment on the judgment of the decision to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger in the conditions that existed that day? Yes, we certainly blew that opportunity to do the right thing. And I guess it wasn't apparent to us, us being NASA, I wasn't part of the decision process, obviously, because I was just debriefing uh, from my second mission at the time. And in fact, uh, we were in the midst of a debrief and somebody stuck their head in the doorway and said, hey, they're at two minutes and counting, you want to take a break and watch the, uh, the launch and then we'll come back and continue the debriefing. And I said, yeah, let's do that. So guess what? We never came back to the debriefing. So we were watching. We had all the air to ground loops in this conference room. We had the video and I watched my friends die on the Challenger. So we couldn't have made a bigger error than what we did. And somehow we lost sight of one fundamental thing. And that was we had never qualified those booster rockets below about 50 degrees. And yet somehow we concluded we were okay to launch when the temperature outside had been down to, what was it, 28 degrees overnight. And at the time of launch, it was 30, 32, 35, something like that. We, we lost sight of the fact that we're outside of our qualification envelope. And it, like I say, it, it cost us very dearly. And at NASA, we referred to ourselves as pre-challenger NASA and post-Challenger NASA. So it was, a, it was a real watershed event. The other thing that didn't happen was the engineers who were the experts on the booster rockets said, no, we don't want to launch at these temperatures. And the NASA engineers, I hate to say, that were over them, browbeat them so bad over that call that Thiokol's management, who built the booster rockets, Thiokol's management said, let us go offline here. It was a telecon. Said, let us go offline here and discuss this. And they overrode their engineers and told NASA, we are go for launch. And so those are some of the things that happened to us. So you don't want to have, you want to have transparency. You want all of your engineers to be able to speak to the highest levels of management, and if they have concerns about it, same thing happened to us with Columbia. The tile engineers on the Columbia accident were really nervous, but the management overrode them and said it's not a problem, or 
if we find out there's a problem, what are we going to be able to do about it anyway? Well, you don't know. You don't know what you're going to do until your back's against the wall. Look at Apollo 13. Maybe there was something we could have done, but we didn't try. So not just, Co not just Challenger, but Columbia as well. We made the wrong call on both of those missions. Now, the question was, what was the scariest part of all the different flying that I've done? And I don't know that I would point to anything and say, okay, this was really scary. I've had some close calls. Um, all, these, all these dead stick landings that I had at Reno in racing planes, I mentioned the three times that I blew up the engine in the second Sea Fury um, that, I, that I raced. Each time, I made a really nice landing. And the reason was not because I'm a superior pilot. The reason was you practice that stuff. And so all the things that you practice very, very extensively are things that you're going to do very well. So I don't know that I've ever had a, a, a real scary one. I will say that um, one of the world records that I set in a friend's airplane, um, I was, it was another little tiny home built with, a, with an 0200, 100 horsepower engine in it. And I was going for the world's time to climb record. I was in a practice flight and I was about 40 miles away from home base, and the propeller disintegrated at 28,000 feet. And so I established best glide, and let me tell you, you don't wanna sit there at a relatively slow speed gliding back 40 miles to home base. You wanna get it on the ground right now, only if you do that, you're not gonna make it back. And so I had to talk to myself and say, okay, you need to be patient. You need to stay right at best glide speed. And do you think you're so good that you're just absolutely gonna survive this? And I had to say to myself, no, no. None of us are so good that you can say, I am positively gonna survive this. So I was talking to myself and saying, you better do this right, because if you don't do this right, then you may not survive it. So I, don't, I wasn't scared but I was, I was capable of saying to myself that, okay, you know, this could turn out very badly. So I think all of us have those. And the more you practice for those kind of scenarios, the better off we are, obviously. Question is, comment on the retirement of the space shuttle. Well, I, I was disappointed by our decision to retire the space shuttle. At the same time, I think I understand the rationale that NASA used in looking at it, and that basically was, you know, it's a wondrous machine when it works right. When it doesn't work right, we're going to lose the entire crew. And I think the philosophy at NASA was capsules are more survivable, parachutes are more survivable. I'm not sure that's true, Chuck Lowry, I'm not sure that's true. Parachutes can be very unforgiving if things aren't perfectly done correctly with parachutes. So I was a little disappointed with it, but they didn't even ask me what I thought. <laughs> but, uh, well, the, the hand has been played. So, so we, are, we are going to build the SLS, the Space Launch System, which gives us the ability to go back to the moon. It gives us the ability to send astronauts to Mars. So. I say it's time to look forward and to move forward, and I was disappointed by the decision, but uh, we still have great things to do in space. Oh, and I have one more great thing to do. Cindy, I have a surprise present for you. So you have to come up here to get a surprise present. I am so pleased that I got invited to come out here uh, and get to speak to all of you here at the Western Museum of Flight. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.